Hey everyone, and welcome to another mini-sode of The Investigation Game. During our time at home, Leah has been creating free webinars every week that are filled with amazing information. So we thought for these next few weeks, instead of our usual mini-sodes, we would give you all the shortened version of the webinars. If you find them informative, feel free to join in on the full-length live event, or if you missed one of the older webinars, we post them all on YouTube. I'll be sure to attach the links to our events page as well as our YouTube page in the show notes. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. Today, I'm excited to share with you finding fraud in payroll. We're wanting to help small business owners and fraud examiners just connect what they know from maybe theory or what they've heard somewhere and connect that to real world. If you receive a PDF report, you're going to have to somehow convert it into a table format to be able to do what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, let's talk about ghost employees. There are several different issues that we like to look for to identify ghost employees. And before we look at this example, I just want to point out that the things we're going to look at today, these are indicators that we might have a problem. Just because we find some of these things we're going to talk about, it doesn't mean that automatically we have fraud. So some of the things we're going to be looking for are duplicate social security numbers, duplicate addresses. We're going to look for employee records that have no addresses. And then also we need to just look at the number of employees. So this is our example of ghost employees, but this contains the last four of socials, their addresses, cities, states, zip codes. These are just all of your employees information. So the first thing we're going to look for are duplicate social security numbers. And we're going to do that through conditional formatting. Conditional formatting allows you to choose duplicate values and then it will highlight them for you. Then we're going to filter. We're going to filter by color. And then as you can see, these are all of the socials that are duplicated. And that doesn't mean that we automatically have fraud, like I mentioned. It just means that we might want to look into these. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do conditional formatting again, and we're going to highlight duplicate values for the address column. Once again, we're going to filter by color, and we're going to look to see which addresses match. And this is only going to pull addresses that match exactly. Of course, if 1005 West 19th uh, had a period in it, or uh, maybe they spelled out 19th, it's not going to pull that information. So then what we're going to do is we're going to look for entries that don't have an address at all. And let's talk about why we would look for that. So we're going to want to look for employee records that don't have an address because If it's a duplicate entry, they may want the check just to be, let's say that they they set this up to not be direct deposit, or maybe they do. Like maybe they know that you check for this. So they don't want to put an address where you have two addresses. Maybe they know that if you print out checks, then you're going to see that there's two checks to the same person. So this is just something to check for. The reason I didn't include the names and why I don't want to search on the names is that one of the common ways that we have a ghost employee is if an employee leaves the business and then whoever is in charge of payroll doesn't remove their employee record, still leaves them on payroll, but maybe they just change their social security number. And then let's say they want to remove the address so that that check doesn't get mailed to that employee because they're wanting to take that money. Also, you mail a check to an employee who's left, they could be honest and say, hey, you know, I got this extra payment. So that's another reason why you want to look for that address if the address is blank. The next step that we're going to take, if an address isn't exactly the same, the conditional formatting using duplicates won't pick it up. And so what we're doing here is we want to extract the number portion of the address. So as you can see from that first address, we have 716 West something. I didn't use the whole name. So uh, it pulls out the 716. Now, the next step is we're going to do concatenate. Uh, It's a function in Excel, and you're going to want to essentially join the address number and the zip or postal code. So as you can see, 716 came from the address column, and then the zip or postal code uh, is connected. So that's how we're going to do that. This allows us to then 
do what we've been doing, we're going to conditionally format to look for duplicate values and filter by color to see what's duplicate. Just as an example, this 200 West van something, we have 200 W period van, and then we have 200 West and then more than likely van. And so if we were looking at this whole address, more than likely these are different social security numbers at the same address. And this isn't uncommon, especially like in manufacturing in a smaller town, you're going to have family members who work in different parts. But then also, this is a really great test if you're working with a client and maybe they have a policy where certain family members can't work for each other. And so this is a good way to see, okay, how many family members do we have working in this organization? And then we can go look at the org chart or go look to see where they're assigned and see if there's any policy or violations in, in that way. Definitely want to look at those. Then also this 721 West Rami, or it didn't have the West in there. Now, once again, these could just be that whoever was entering the information didn't know the employee record already existed and they left out the West. This happens a lot in vendor files. So it could also happen here. Although we've got different social security numbers that might not be as high risk, but we still just wanna go look at these. So then we're gonna take a look at all of those. And the, the ones that, I that would kind of rank as higher risk for me are gonna be the ones that have duplicate socials duplicate addresses or our address number plus the zip code, the more of those data points, those would probably rank higher. You do want to make sure that you know the number of employees. So how many employees actually work? You need, you don't have a loss at this point. You have a loss when you go look to see, okay, let's track down all these duplicates. Should all of these people have been paid? If you identify, which this happened to us last year in a case, if you identify that there are people that are on payroll and they shouldn't have been paid, they were let go a long time ago, but they haven't been taken out of the active system, go look at payroll and make sure they've been paid. If no money has been paid, then you don't have a loss. Okay, duplicate payroll. This one's kind of fun. So this one, I have a story on this one because this lady was a bookkeeper for a small consulting business. And originally they had just paid everyone on the 15th and the last day of the month by check. Most of them were local. Then one of their employees lived in another state and he said, is there any way you can do a direct deposit so that I can get paid when everyone else gets paid? The owner thought this was reasonable. Uh, the bookkeeper, he told her, go ahead and use, you know, set up payroll so that we can do direct deposit. Well, she was doing payroll out of QuickBooks. She set up his direct deposit, but while she was setting up his direct deposit, she just went ahead and set up her own direct deposit. But he didn't notice this because she was still getting paid by check. Let's look at this duplicate payroll. So this is the actual data set from this case. And the way that we knew about all of the check payments was from bank statements because we could actually see what had been paid to her through a check. We also had the payroll reports, but we made sure that the checks that were on the payroll reports actually went to her. Then we knew about the direct deposits because of payroll reports, and we could connect that to the bank statement by looking at the uh, ACHs for payroll. So we could confirm all of that actually happened. Then one of the things we wanted to look at was since we knew she was getting checks, and then she was also getting direct deposits. We wanted to see like, was she paying herself half in check, half in direct deposit? Cause that would have been okay. And so one of the things we did kind of at the beginning was just look at what day of the week was she being paid? So because they were paid on the 15th and the last day of the month, then that's not always the same, right? Like, I mean, it's going to be a different day every month, but what did stand out to us are all of these checks that were paid on Sunday. And so obviously that's why we wanted to look at that. Also, I wanna mention that we were looking at check dates, not the dates that the checks cleared because we wanna see when was she actually issuing all of these checks. Then the other thing we started looking at on this was, so we have our Sunday and then we've got all these other days. We're gonna look for all of the checks that are issued around the same date to see how many checks or direct deposits she's getting in a month. So an example of this would be in April of 2008, like I'm showing that we have a direct deposit and a check. 
The other thing that I find helpful when you're looking for duplicate direct deposits or checks is to graph it. And um, in this case, so we have uh, the direct deposits are the red dots and then the blue diamonds are the checks. And so you can kind of see um, where I pointed out, she got two checks or direct deposits several times. The other fun thing about graphing this is that you can see how many more payments she was paying to herself every year. And this is pretty common if you've worked fraud cases at all, is that the losses start out small and then they just continue to grow over the life of the scheme. One of the things we had to do on this one too is just once again, you have to connect it to some sort of loss. So uh, some sort of payment. So if she had been paying herself multiple checks or direct deposits, but it all totaled what she was supposed to be paid, then we don't have a loss. It's just a really strange way to be paid. But maybe she wanted the direct deposit to go to one account and the check to go to another account. Who knows? So we actually have to compare this odd behavior to what was she paid versus what should she have been paid. And in this particular case, with this scheme, she stole about $85,000. The next one, uh, this lady was an administrator of in a partnership. She was also the wife of one of the partners. I want to just point out that the risk that you have when you have multiple companies, and especially if you have multiple companies with payroll. And so this administrator was told that she would be paid $100,000 a year. And by looking at, once again, those Excel payroll records, we were able to see that she had overpaid herself, including a nice little bonus on April 15th uh, of $10,000. And so for you know a little over a year, she overpaid herself 94,000. Well, then we started looking at the next payroll company and there for the period we looked at, she should have been paid an additional 65,000 because of the prior year, it was a little different. So we did this on a number of pay periods basis. And so in 2017, she was overpaid by 65,000. At the same time, she's overpaying herself out of the main company. They had another company that kind of helped manage the building and so forth. And QuickBooks, you can easily set up payroll service out of QuickBooks. So she decided to also pay herself out of the building company and just set it up and just started paying herself an extra $10,000. And she was not supposed to be paid out of that. Her job involved managing all of the finances of these companies. And this was just really was minor. You know, whenever they set up the businesses that, that one business owns the building and then one runs the business and then they pay the building company rent. That's kind of what was going on. So she shouldn't have been paid that. This was part of a $1.5 million embezzlement. She stole lots of different ways. But for, through the payroll, she stole $170,000. This next one is our off-cycle off payroll and reimbursements. And on this one, like we did before, looking at the day of the week, we're going to look for the day of the week by entering our formula. Then we're going to filter. And for this company, they paid payroll every Friday. That was their standard. So we have all kinds of other days that they were making payroll. The one that stood out to me were the Saturday payments at first. But once I started looking at these more carefully, these were a bunch of just small payments and it turned out it was expense reimbursements. It still might be something that you want to go look at just to make sure that these expense reimbursements should have happened, but this ended up being okay. Then what we're going to do is we're going to look at all the other days and I chose just Monday to look at next. So we're going to look at Monday and immediately, if you notice on that top line, we have a $100,000 payment. We have a $60,000 payment. And so what I want to do, I can use the filters to then kind of drill down and see, okay, what types of payments end in even dollar amounts? I start noticing that we have this Pierce Forsyth. He seems to be getting a lot of these payments. But then I also notice that we have a lot of $1,000 payments. So we asked the client, what are these $1,000 payments? And they said, oh, they were making company-wide bonuses. Okay, so we're probably fine on that. But what about this $100,000 or $60,000? Well, that definitely was not okay. So what I'm doing here is sorting by name. And then I want to go look at this Pierce Forsyth character and see what, all, what we have going on. We have a lot of payments. And these are directly from the payroll provider. So we know that these were debited from the account. 
Something else interesting about these payments is that they paid payroll primarily through direct deposit. And these particular, a lot of these payments were uh, paid by check. That's why there's a check number there. Just continue to drill down and see if once we get rid of the bonus payments, what happens. In removing the $1,000 payments, we could then see which other employees were receiving money. And it turns out that it was um, some of this guy's friends. He was also paying, they were employees, but he was also paying off his friends. But that's a way to use the days of the week and also to filter for even dollar payments to identify just kind of weird payroll payments. This next example, I actually use an idea. And on this case, the employees did receive expense reimbursements and they also received petty cash payments. And this should have only happened three times a month. So whenever I know this from a client, I like to then go look at the data and see what actually happened. So what should have happened? And we're going to compare that to what actually happened. And this is a screenshot from IDEA, but we just summarized by payee and also by year, we create like a year month column so that we can see what were the number of records. So how many payments in a month were they receiving for either petty cash or expense reimbursements? And this is pretty tedious, but we then drill down to see which items are supported, expense reimbursements or petty cash, what were the real ones? And then this will identify what were the fake ones, but that does require some manual work. I just want to show you our gross pay template example. What I did was I just took information from the report and I just made a few more columns so that I could easily copy and paste this into our template. And you can actually do this by payroll. I mean, we're looking at several years of data here, but you could just do this on a monthly, quarterly basis. So the first thing is that I copy and paste my data into the macro and with the payday, gross pay amount, and the employee name. And then the macro on this first page will summarize how much you paid to employees on each payday. So something that I noticed immediately in doing this is that our gross pay kept fluctuating. So we might have 27,000 one week, but then the next week it was 9,000. And so that's just kind of odd, especially if the same people are working. Maybe we've got salaried people, maybe we've got hourly people, and then that would make sense. But those are just some things you can kind of notice from that first screen. Then the next tab is our gross pay scatter graph. And I really love this graph a lot because as you can see, all of the normal or expected payments are all grouped together at the bottom. And the things that are abnormal are sticking out. This March 12th, 2015 payment of $200,000, we can go back to our original data set, go look for that date so that we can see who this $200,000 payment was made to. And as we already know, it was to the Pierce Forsyth character. And so then we can see, wow, that's really odd. But as you can see, it just sticks out very clearly. And so if you're doing this on a monthly or quarterly basis, you can identify these payments and go research it then, not when you're at a, in this case, a $3.5 million loss. Then this last graph shows our total gross pay by payday. So this is where I think you can see the off cycle payroll that works really well. Even some of these smaller outliers, these are just when some of those other payments were made that weren't paid company-wide. The Investigation Game is brought to you by Workman Forensics. For more information on the business and its services, visit workmanforensics.com. Find us on social media on any social media platform at Workman Forensics. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or topic ideas, please email us at podcast at Thanks for listening.